Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that is sometimes just a little bit, just a tiny bit nostalgic for the simpler days of MySpace. Remember the top six friends? Was it six? Was it 10? Okay, there was drama there, but it was the good old days. <laughs> I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 122. Today, you'll be meeting Julie, the CEO of Mary Rose Boutique. She's also the designer of Hope Continues and the founder of the Mary Rose Foundation. I'm going to give you a little heads up that we will be talking about anti-fat bias and eating disorders for about the last third of our conversation. And it's totally Oh, totally okay to skip that section. Julie did something that is kind of unheard of in the world of selling clothes to people. It's totally difficult to execute. And yet when it happens is incredibly impactful. She made the decision to switch from selling fast fashion at the peak of the pandemic. I hope it was the peak to becoming a sustainable and ethical small business. You'll hear all about it in our conversation. It's so fascinating to me. Before we move on, let's do some housekeeping. I know everybody loves loves the word housekeeping, right? <laughs> First off, new episodes of Close Horse will now be released late in the day on Sunday or even on Monday mornings. That's not the biggest shift in the world, but after two years of it always being there on Sunday morning, you know, that is a shift. I know some of you listen to it on Sundays. It's part of your routine, and I just want you to know why that's changing. You have to remember that I, I, you know, I have to be honest and say that working a full-time job and running Close Horse on top of that, is it's a lot. And maybe someday I'll just get to work on Close Horse, but right now it's just not possible. Over the last few months, I've been working nine to six or seven or eight at my day job, then shifting into working on Close Horse until it's time to go to bed. And I get into bed, I'm just like so exhausted. <laughs> like there's nothing left to give. It's like brushing my teeth is almost too much at that point. I do it, don't worry, I brush them. <laughs> It's like, you have to remember that I'm not just making podcast episodes. There's Instagram posts and conversations with guests and so much correspondence and scheduling. And to be honest, I'm super behind on all of my emails right now because I just never get a chance to sit down and do those when I'm feeling awake and focused. Maybe I'll do that tonight. Anyway, this has been a very difficult pace to keep up and I'm really proud of myself for how much I've been able to do but I also need to think about my own mental and physical health. So I'm trying a new thing where I don't work on Saturdays at all. Normally, I jump out of bed at 7 a.m. I work on Close Horse all day until the episode is done because there's a lot to do. You know, there's like writing and recording my segments, creating transcripts, writing show notes, making the Instagram posts. Then I have to like create the blog post on Squarespace, upload all kinds of stuff here and there and everywhere. And that's after I've spent weeknight evenings recording with guests and editing interviews, you know, making Instagram posts and all that stuff. So now I'm just going to do most of the Saturday work on Sundays. It's so luxurious to have one day completely free of work and I can already feel the difference in my mental health. So that is going to be the plan going forward. Next, I wanted to say very excitedly that I was recently interviewed for an article from The Cut about sustainable shopping, and I want all of you to read it, so I'm going to share that link in the show notes. I would also like to remind you that submissions for the next round of audio essays are due on 415. Some people call it April 15th. Here in the United States, I'm pretty sure that's the deadline for taxes. That's a bit, little bit less than two weeks away. Here's the theme. What is a style rule that you're going to break? What was your journey to realizing that your style was personal and nothing to do with anyone else's rules and opinions? Or conversely, are you fearful of breaking those rules and why? Tell us all about your relationship with how you dress. Your essay should be between three to 10 minutes long and you re can record it using the voice memo app on your phone or computer. You'll find all the details for submitting your audio essay in the show notes, so go check that out. All right, next, let's take a few minutes to thank some of the latest Patreon supporters. I'm way behind here, just like everything else in my life right now. 
<laughs> First off is Audrey Moore, a.k.a. Audrey M. Threads. Audrey is a sewist with one of the cutest and most organized sewing corners I've ever seen. Thank you for your support, Audrey. Next is Sarah Skriloff, who called in with an amazing hotline message a few months ago about expecting our belongings to spark joy and this constant push to upgrade. And I actually think about that message on a regular basis. So thank you so much again, Sarah, for such a great message and for supporting Close Horse. Jen Jannon is also a patron, and she's the owner of Jackie Wo Vintage, one of my favorite online vintage sellers. Honestly, Jen, this whole time I thought your name was Jackie. <laughs> Glad to know. Nice to meet you, Jen. Uh, seriously, go check out her Instagram grid because she has such a great, incredible, and well-curated assortment of vintage. Thank you so much. Next is Claudia Platt, who despite some serious internet stalking, you know I put in the time, I could not find anything about, but I'm sure Claudia is a super rad person because close horse patrons always are. Lastly, but not leastly, is Sam Conover of Broad Lingerie, Toronto's D+, plus. that's not a grade, that's a size, bra and swim shop. And guess what? Sam is going to be an upcoming guest on the show teaching us all about why bras are the way they are and how we can make the best choices when shopping for them. It was super educational for me, and I think it will be for you too. Thank you so much for all of your support, Sam. If you would like to join this group of illustrious individuals by supporting my work here on Close Horse, please check out patreon.com slash close horse podcast. Okay, let's take a moment to listen to two ads from our sponsors. Thanks to their support, I've been able to cover pretty substantial chunk of the hosting and transcription services this month. So I'm I'm very grateful. Let's listen. All of you in the close horse community know that I'm obsessed with two things. Number one is leading a hashtag secondhand first way of life, meaning prioritizing the use of existing materials and items rather than buying new. And number two, supporting small businesses. I firmly believe that small business is the future and our future depends on the intersection of secondhand first and small business. That's the sweet spot right there. But real talk, running a small business, I know some of you are about to nod your heads as I say this, running a small business is hard and it's kind of overwhelming to know where to begin. It's even more complicated when it's a small business with a focus on upcycling. If you're a maker who has been thinking about starting your own business using upcycled materials or you're looking to really, I don't know, level up your existing upcycling business and turn it into a full-time job that actually pays your bills, then I have a suggestion for you. Check out the Rags to Riches Virtual Textile Upcycling Summit on April 20th through 22nd. Learn from the pros how to grow a textile upcycling business that you love, that supports the planet and your ideal lifestyle. Learn from the pros how to grow a textile upcycling business that supports the planet and you. Rags to Riches shines bright light on leaders in textile upcycling. You'll have the chance to learn from entrepreneurs, manufacturers, suppliers, authors, and activists offering alternative options in textile consumption. You'll also establish tangible next steps to level up your upcycling business. Yes, you can turn your business into a full-time job that supports and sustains you. And you'll also get to submerge yourself in the company of awesome people who are working to do better for the planet and make really cool stuff. After attending Rags to Riches, you'll know that you are part of our environmental solution. Textile upcycling entrepreneurs, thinkers, authors, and activists will expand your knowledge of careful consumption. You'll learn a dependable method for sourcing goods and materials. You'll be able to reliably source materials beyond the thrift stream. You'll network with and support upcycling brands that align with your values and aesthetic. And you'll understand the power of your purchases, both as a business and as an individual. You will realize once and for all that creative textile upcycling is a viable, sustainable 
business option. You'll hear from makers who have traveled diverse paths to arrive at their business sweet spot by being financially sustainable and defining success on their own terms, all while doing great things for the planet. And you'll have tangible next steps to level up your upcycling. You'll learn from the pros as they share specific expertise that will engage, inspire, and help you know the importance to both you and the planet of taking your textile upcycling up a notch. Tickets for Rags to Riches include three solid days of inspiration and education, 60 days of free access to Stitcherhood, which is an inclusive community of upcycling entrepreneurs. You'll get access to a private Rags to Riches networking group, a virtual goodie bag, games and prizes, and so much more. Go learn more at bit.ly slash Rags to Riches Summit. Something most of you might not know about me is that I actually studied painting in college. How I ended up in fashion is a whole other, much longer story. For me, there is nothing more relaxing and enjoyable than cozying up to some canvas or some really nice watercolor paper with a brush and paint. For me, the act of painting is almost meditative. I always feel fresh and ready to conquer anything when I finish. And my favorite subject matter, just on a personal level, is painting portraits of other people. In fact, I would say my number one artistic influence is 20th century portrait artist Alice Neal. Go check her out. Her sons made an incredible documentary about her. It makes me cry every time I watch it. Five stars. Whether your style is more Alice Neal, Jackson Pollock, or that raccoon on Instagram that paints, you know who I'm talking about. There is something so magical about taking some time to yourself to move paint around with a brush. But you know what's not magical? Tracking down those supplies. It feels like such a super unfun errand. And half the time, you can't find what you're looking for because these days, art supply stores are a disappearing breed. Fortunately, proud close horse sponsor Let's Make Art makes it easy with amazing products and tutorials for you so you can focus on the good part learning and making art. Let's Make Art is a revolutionary crafting company that aims to help everyone channel their inner artist, whether they're 3, 63, or 103, by delivering great art supplies and kits directly to your front door. You don't have to spend four years at art school to enjoy painting, but I know that getting started can be intimidating. What kind of brushes should you buy? Never mind paper, pens, paints, and so on. The first time I walked into an art supply store, I was simultaneously excited and really freaked out. What if I chose the wrong thing? What if I embarrassed myself at the checkout by trying to mix acrylics and oils? Would the salespeople laugh at me after I walked out of the store? mortifying. Fortunately, Let's Make Art offers a monthly art box that includes supplies and tutorials, including free lessons from in-house artists. That helps you make some magic of your own with paint. And if you're already a great master, Let's Make Art has plenty to offer you too, with a well-curated assortment of paints, brushes, and other supplies. I'm an oil painter first, but my other two favorite media are gouache and ink, and Let's Make Art has a great selection of those, along with watercolor, acrylic, watercolor pencils, another personal favorite, and so much more. If you're feeling stuck about what to paint happens to all of us, Let's Make Art has got you covered with an assortment of pre-assembled kits for painting landscapes, animals, and just generally beautiful things. They also, these kits, they make great gifts. What else? Let's Make Art offers supplies, kits, and tutorials for watercolor painting, lettering, all kinds of other things, including kits for kids ages 5 to 11. There's nothing better than watching them use their own imagination and feel the joy of creating something of their very own. It's a pretty great gift as well. Let's make art simple together. Check out Let's Make Art today by going to my special link, zen.ai slash clotheshorse. I'll be sharing that in the show notes, of course. That's zen.ai slash clotheshorse to get 20% off. The coupon code is activated at checkout. I'm 
proud to say that I began my career in fashion by working retail. Most of you know that already, but you know, I just wanted to say it again. And I that meant literally working in a store. First, I was a seasonal part-time sales associate, which meant no guaranteed hours, no benefits, not even the expectation that I would have a job in two weeks. Great, great, great business model there. Soon I became a department manager and that would ultimately be the bridge to a very surprising career in buying. Working retail and being a single parent with very little support from anyone else was really, really fucking hard. Understatement right there. When I think back to what a hard time that was, it kind of makes me angry at the world as a whole. I'm not going to lie. I sometimes lay in bed at night and think, man, I really hate that world that I lived in then. (laughs) So much still residually. My partner had died just a few months before my daughter was born. My entire world had collapsed when this happened. I quit my job. I moved home with my mom. It was the last thing I ever wanted to do. I lost my friends, my life as I had known it. And honestly, every single one of my life dreams had been obliterated the day my partner Ryan died. I had nothing financially or socially by the time I moved across the country to Portland, Oregon. It just it just felt like the place where I could I could get better, where life could be good. But I had nothing. What I did have was the constant fear of homelessness, of somehow losing my child to the foster care system because I was so broke and unable to provide the way a good, upstanding, middle-class parent would have been, right? Like one that was married and had a car and could afford to take the bus. Luxuries, right? I also had the constant judginess of society as a whole. That idea that being a single mother meant that I was a bad person, a floozy, a slut, a drain on society. You know, I actually saw someone post on Reddit last week. It was like they were getting something off their chest and they were basically like... I hate single mothers, they're a drain on society, they're bad people, they're selfish, on and on and on. And I just, I was like, you know what? Do not engage. Just close the app and go outside and go for a walk. And I did that. But people still feel that way. But it felt just so palpable at this time when I was much younger and had this small child that was mine and mine alone to care for. Somehow it felt like everyone thought that my child and the challenges of raising a child alone, that was a punishment. A punishment for what? Having sex, being born with a uterus. I'm not sure. It was just such a gross time to be a young woman, an even grosser time to be a young single mother. I was struggling so hard to just keep a roof over our heads, to keep it together, to afford diapers and food and all the other basic needs for myself and my child. And at the same time, I was still dealing with the grief. Grief is such an understatement, too, of losing my partner. This grief would haunt me for well more than a decade. And honestly, that grief still lives with me today. But back then... I cried almost every night. I mean, I was just sad. Sad is not the right word. It was agonizing, agonizing. I was scared. And yet I had to pull it together every day to be a good mom and take care of us because survival doesn't allow for grief. I certainly couldn't tell the world, hey, world, I had a hard, traumatic childhood. There's really no one in this world who I can count on to love me and support me. And I lost the love of my life. And I'm I'm just trying my hardest to survive. No, I, I couldn't do that. Instead, I had to act cool. Like everything was fine. Because that's what the world wanted from me. If I was going to have the audacity to be a tattooed single mother, then I sure as hell must act like everything was fine and never complain. Because I was lucky to be even included in this world. But I was 
oh man, I was just so desperate for any crumb of anything that came my way. It made me accept shitty people. Yes, fundamentally shitty people as friends. I dated super toxic individuals. Man, it's like a lineup in front of me right now of just one terrible person after another. And I put up with any and all abuse that I faced at my job because I was always one missed paycheck away from homelessness. So I had to be the best employee in all ways. I wish I could go back in time and tell my younger self that she's doing a really great job and everything's going to be okay, even if it doesn't feel that way. There was a sales associate who worked in my store named Veronica, and she was cool. I really liked her as a person. She had great taste in music and a dry sense of humor, but she was a terrible employee, like constantly late for work and creating nonstop drama when she was finally clocked in for her shift. But I kind of gave her a pass on all of that because like I said, I liked her. I think I thought she was my friend. One day, the store manager pulled me into the office and said, hey, listen, I noticed that you haven't been writing up Veronica when she's late for work. I kind of shrugged my shoulders because even though I was a model employee, I had no choice but to be, I never wrote people up for being late. Most of us took the bus to work. And you know what? Buses are unreliable, right? I was always on time for work, despite having to wrangle a toddler, because I biked everywhere. Mostly because I couldn't actually afford to take the bus. And to be fair, my feet were always way more reliable when it came to arriving somewhere on time. The store manager was also a person who I liked very much. A really lovely person to this day. And I'm sure it sucked for her to have to give me this talking to. But she gave me an ultimatum. Write up Veronica the next time she was late or be written up myself. And if that happened, I wouldn't be eligible for a raise or a bonus. These things are a pretty big deal when you're so broke you can't afford bus fare. So I agreed. Fine. Okay. I would write her up the next time she was late. I even kind of pulled Veronica aside and was like, hey, you should really try to be on time more because like people are getting upset about it. And she sort of laughed it off. But that was me trying to say like, hey, listen. Here's the deal, bro. Like, you got to get it together. It didn't work because I flew home for a few weeks to see my family in Pennsylvania. And while I was there, Veronica was late for work every single day. And so she was written up by the other managers and ultimately fired because, like, I don't know if you've worked retail before, but this is a pretty standard model. Like, you get a verbal warning, which is really written down. I don't know why. It's called the verbal warning. Then you get a written warning. That's literally written down also. It's in your file. You might get one more written warning for the same thing, and then you're fired if it happens again. So be late every day in a week. You're going to lose your job. When I heard the news, I was I was both sad to see her go, but I was relieved that I wasn't going to have to be the person to write her up for something as dumb as being late. But then then I received a message via MySpace, and it, and it was from Veronica. You're a loser, she said. Your family is ashamed of you. You're a bad mother, and the best thing you can do is just die because you'll never amount to anything. There were a few more statements, and they were all equally terrible. And I'm not going to lie. It was was really hurtful, especially because, you know, despite my brave facade, I was struggling so hard emotionally and otherwise just, just to live life every day. To be told that I was still a failure, a loser, not worth living, it was brutal. Yeah, I cried a lot. I mentioned the whole thing to some friends of mine who were also friends with her, but I suppose anytime I say friends in this episode, I should probably just, we should all assume that friends is in quotes. And they, my friends, in quotes, dismissed it and continued to hang out with Veronica, like, I was the one who was wrong for being sensitive. And you know what? I did what so many of us do when I'm faced with situations like this. I gaslighted myself into believing that I was the problem. If I weren't so sensitive, I would laugh at that message. If I weren't such a loser, no one would be able to write that message in the first place. It was all my fault. I'm the bad person, the the wrong person, the defective person in this scenario. 
I assume that Veronica probably forgets sending that message. She probably forgot it immediately. Maybe she was drunk when she sent it. But I I never forgot it. I mean, I'm talking about it right now, right? I copied it over from notebook to notebook over the years, forcing myself to confront it every day. And at first, it was a stern reminder that I had to stop being such a disappointing loser. And for me, that meant working hard and advancing in my career, which is just like, isn't that what capitalism says? Like, isn't that like the bootstrap myth? Like, it's your fault that things are hard. So get it together, right? (sighs) That mindset made me even more desperate for every job and every promotion. And it meant that I overlooked a lot of red flags, toxic bosses, bad behaviors, and all in all, unethical business practices on the part of my employer. Allowing myself to think about these bad things, since apparently I was such a sensitive crybaby, would only reinforce my loser status. So I just put on my blinders and kept working because all of this was my responsibility. Over the years, I'm not going to lie, I felt kind of proud of myself, like I was doing something with myself, something that single moms from trailer parks, like me, couldn't do without being especially clever and hardworking. Maybe I was a special person after all. At one point, I said to a friend, I think my family should be proud of me because I'm finally successful. And that friend also probably a friend in quotes, responded, you're not successful. This would have been a great time if we could just press pause on the story of my life right there. This would have been a great time for me to ditch my bad friends, tear that page with Veronica's note out of my notebook, start seeing a therapist, and just kind of restart my life with some healthier habits, right? But instead... I doubled down on all of it. I continued to work for bad companies doing bad things. I looked at Veronica's note in a new way that it didn't matter what anyone else said as long as I was proud of myself. And I was proud of myself for somehow stomaching all the bad stuff I saw happening around me at work. This went on for years until the pandemic. Just recently... Right before the pandemic began, my boss had said something that had created a massive, massive crack in that facade, in that way I was working and thinking about myself. She said, you would be more successful in your career if you cared less about the people working for you. At first, at first I was like, oh, Amanda, why am I so soft and sensitive and caring about others? Of course, once again, as I was very good at doing by now, I was totally gaslighting myself into being the problem. I was the problem. I found myself crying every morning about what a soft, mushy failure I was. And if I could just care less about people and the world, then I would be someone that someone somewhere could be proud of. And then I lost my job. It was to say it was rough, was an understatement. I played The Sims all day. I spent hours on Reddit. I tried to pretend for my family that everything was fine, but I had plenty of time to think about my life, my jobs, the industry that had employed me for so long, this industry that had simultaneously made me feel like a success and a failure every single day. This industry that had defined what it meant to be a failure, a loser, and an embarrassment. And also what it would mean to be successful, to be proud of oneself, to feel good about the impact of one's life. Because I'd never really been allowed to be proud of myself, truly, to feel good, truly, about the impact of my life. I felt lost for quite a while there. I felt like everything Veronica had written to me 15 years before that was true. That she had somehow seen what a tremendous waste of life I was. 
you know, I've mentioned around here that I had cancer when I was a kid and there would be people in my family who would say to me, lots of kids with the same cancer died, but you didn't. You must be here for a special reason, a purpose. That puts pressure on you to not be a waste of life. Like we all feel that pressure, but that's added pressure to be like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be a waste. But maybe Veronica was right. Maybe I was a waste. It was a lot for me to think about, to think about what I was doing and what it meant to me and what I wasn't doing and what that meant to me. Close Horse was born out of all of this thinking. And I didn't know what was going to happen with it, but it was a great way to start unpacking the sadness and rage that had been building up inside of me during the years I was working for all of those fast fashion brands. I finally could speak about the bad things I saw happening and why they happened and how how we could all as a community untangle it and force the industry to do better. It gave me a sense of purpose that I'd never had before. And you know what? It made me feel proud of myself in a way that it never I'd never had before. It made me think, hey, maybe maybe I'm not a waste of life, right? Something that Julie said multiple times in our conversation, which you're going to hear in a few minutes, it's this thing she said has stuck with me since she said it. She said, the actions of one impact us all. And I believe that. When I hear from one of you that something I said here or on Instagram made you rethink something you took for granted and make changes based on that, it makes my day, my week, my month, it never gets old because that's why I'm here. And I can guarantee that information you are sharing with others, changes you are making, stuff you are posting about on social media or discussing in regular day-to-day conversation, these things are making an impact on others around you. You are making an impact. We all have so much power, so much influence, so much ability to change the world and make it better. And this is something, I'm, you know, it took me a really long time to figure out because I thought the best way to have any kind of impact, the path to being successful, that's in quotes too, it would mean keeping my mouth shut, my head down, pushing my feelings into some bin in the corner of my mental closet and just working and working. I know now that I was wrong. Veronica's MySpace message was straight garbage. And yes, I no longer keep it around thanks to some good advice from my therapist. But I'm sure so many of you have similar stories about someone else making you feel as if you had to be silent and play along. Of someone making you feel like you were a waste, a failure, a loser. Just as those people had the power to make you feel powerless, to make you feel bad, We all have the power to make others feel good, motivated, excited about a better world. We can remind everyone that, yes, a better world is within reach. It's easy, so easy to feel defeated as one person, as a singularity. But we all have the ability to make this world more fair, healthier, happier, safer, all of the good things. And step one for all of us is realizing that. It's a lot of power. Step two is taking actions, whether it's something as major as what Julie did with her business, we're going to talk about that, or just sharing information with friends. We all count. None of us are a waste, a failure, a loser. And we can all lead the world into a better place just by being ourselves, by proudly sharing our feelings and ideas, and by welcoming others to join us as we do this. And speaking of individuals taking action toward big changes, I want to give a shout out to someone I totally don't know at all. Her name is Christy Cassidy. She's doing something pretty amazing to force change and accountability from Etsy. Christy has been selling on Etsy since 2007. And if you've listened to the Etsy sewed series of Clothes Horse, that's this podcast, then you know that Etsy has been prioritizing profits over people for 
years, so many years now, and specifically profits over its sellers, who are the entire reason that Etsy exists. Because Etsy doesn't make things to sell. When you buy something from Etsy, it's not like buying something from Zara, right? Zara made that thing. You give them the money. They make a profit off of selling that thing that they made to you, right? Etsy makes its money by taking a share of the sales made by the sellers on its platforms, by the people who made the things that are selling. Etsy is really selling a service. And really, what seems like we, the shoppers, are the customers, the real customers of Etsy are the sellers. <laughs> it's a lot, right? There's so much to unpack there. And I recommend you listen to the, those, the Etsy sodes to get the full picture because it's really complicated. But some of the issues that both Christy and just Etsy, the Etsy community as a whole, have been calling out are ever escalating fees, increased competition from businesses who are selling mass produced products on the platform, which not only keep selling prices low and make it harder for sellers to make a living, it also makes it harder to find actual makers on the platform. I'm always hearing stories about buying something on Etsy, getting it and realizing it's like a crappy mass produced item. I've I've seen a lot of really bad t-shirts. <laughs> What else? Etsy has a lot of dumb policies around ratings and advertising that make it even harder for businesses to be seen. And to top it all off, they provide just the worst support for sellers who, once again, are the true customers of Etsy. I'm going to share an article from The Verge that breaks it all down. It'll be on the show notes. And I want to thank Selena Sanders for sending it my way. But There are two important things to call out here before you go read the article. One, Etsy sellers are calling for a boycott of Etsy on April 11th. That's coming up in eight days from when I'm recording this, this, what is this, monologue? I'm not really sure. Episode, whatever. April 11th. Sellers will put their shops in vacation mode so no one can buy anything. And buyers are encouraged to skip purchasing anything from Etsy that day. Why April 11th? That's when a new round of fee increases go into effect, raising the cost of selling on the platform by 30%. That's that's a lot of money coming out of sellers' pockets and going into Etsy's. Secondly, Christy has also started a petition. Christy has also started a petition to stop the fee increases that all of you should go sign ASAP. I'll I'll share the link in the show notes. I don't know Christy at all, but I'm super proud of what she's doing, and I'm excited to see Etsy sellers take collective action to demand accountability from Etsy. As Julie said, the actions of one impact us all. So if one person can successfully pull off an Etsy boycott and create a, this is almost the bigger part, a PR nightmare for Etsy in the process, then it will force the platform to make changes to its way of doing business. And this can have a trickle-down effect to other platforms where small businesses operate, like Depop, Poshmark, eBay, etc. And this could have major impacts on small businesses everywhere, which in the long term could shift wealth away from big corporations and allow smaller businesses to flourish. Yes, that really can happen. This is the effect of one person in action. So go read the article, sign the petition, and share this with all of your friends and family. Let's support this action. Let's change the world together. It all starts with one person. And speaking of a person making some major changes, I'm going to stop talking now. Let's jump into my conversation with Julie. Julie, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah. Hello. So my name is Julie Allen. I am from the Portland, Oregon area, and I own a women's clothing boutique called Mary Rose Boutique, and I founded the Mary Rose Foundation, and also we have our own line of clothing called Hope Continues that is focused on size inclusion and ethically made pieces. So when you reached out to me, you know, lots of businesses reach out to me all the time, But what really set you apart is you said like, hey, we used to be a fast fashion boutique and we're not anymore. So 
I mean, that's a that's a big change. I mean, like, you know, something we talk about on the podcast all the time is, you know, for like, say, Zara or Urban mm-hmm. Outfitters or any of those big fast fashion companies to suddenly change their ways is kind of impossible, it, right? Because it's like baked yeah. into their model. How did you do it? It was really, really hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> understatement. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah. Right? It was very, very challenging. So we've been in business. We are going into our fifth year in business. So we've been, you know, we we were pretty well established as a fast fashion boutique. And we had the brick and mortar. Um, since, uh, three, four years ago, we've had the actual storefront. But prior to that, we were online only. And then when COVID really hit in early 2020, we switched all, all the way to online, mm-hmm. right? And uh, with that came a massive surge in sales. And so we had just dipped our toes into fast fashion at this point. And 2020 came, COVID, pandemic, lock, you know, all the things. And we went full force into fast fashion. We ended up having a 5,000 square foot warehouse. <laughs> oh my gosh. It is, it is kind of painful to say, really, like looking back. Um, but then what happened was one day I was just walking into our warehouse, you know, just casually walking into there, <laughs> prepping for this live sale, right? That was probably over a hundred pieces. Wow. For, we did these, yeah, we did these multiple times a week. We did these live sales that, you know, the the sell as much as you can, as fast as possible, as cheap as possible, to as many people as possible, right? That's just the status quo in the fashion oh, industry. Totally, That's, totally, yeah. yeah. More, more, more. Like you are not enough as you are. So here, let me let me sell you all these things. <laughs> yeah. Right? And I remember for some reason, I just like saw what was right in front of me. I saw five thousand square feet covered in plastic, <sighs> and covered in. It, it was garbage. Literally, garbage was everywhere. Like I'm not even kidding. We had a corner in that warehouse that was dedicated to garbage that couldn't fit in the garbage so we had to yes it was so bad because fast fashion it comes wrapped in plastic Mm -hmm. and then it comes on a plastic hanger and I stopped and for the first time I saw what was right in front of me and I was like what am I doing what is this and so then I started to learn more about the fashion industry and it is embarrassing to say but I didn't know I had owned a boutique for, at this point, three and a half-ish years, and I had no idea that child labor was a thing. I had no idea the amount of waste that the fashion industry produces. I didn't know. And once I started to learn and see the reality that was fast fashion, I said to my uh, my business partner, who I also happen to be married to, which is a whole nother conversation, <laughs> I said to him, I said, we can't do this anymore. Right. Like, we we can't do this. We have got to switch. Like, I, I don't know what the solution is, but I know that I cannot be a part of mm-hmm. this. And he looked at me and he said, you're going to lose the entire business. And I was like, I don't care. Like, I, I can't, I can't do it. Like, once you really start to see and understand, mm-hmm. like... Like people in our supply chain, first of all, we don't know what's going on. You know, there is zero transparency in the fast fashion world. You know, you like to think, or we like to think just because something says USA made or, you know, whatever it says, it, it doesn't mean anything. And so this was early 2021. And so we spent a good year redesigning and rebuilding our business. I mean, it's an entirely new business model. So when you say like Zara and H&M, it's built into their model, that is absolutely true. We had to make an entirely new business model. And that is a tough switch. That was, we lost probably 70% of our customers, our revenue. I mean, we were... We were down well over half uh, 2021 compared to 2020. But it's worth it. It is hands down worth it because I want people to be treated like human beings. Like that's, yeah. it's just, I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand. I really don't. And I didn't know. I didn't know prior to early 2021 how bad it was. I mean, honestly, most people who work in the industry don't know that, you know, like it's not something that you talk about. I mean, I can guarantee that none of the 
sales reps you were working with at any of the vendors yeah. knew either because it's not like they get to go to the factory and see what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if they asked any questions, they would lose their job. Like there would be repercussions oh, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. So when we started to switch the business from fast fashion to slow fashion, you know, first of all, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> we were like, I don't want to do this and I want to do this, but I have no idea how to get to from point A to point B, right? <laughs> right. And then, I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. So it took us about a year. And now we're um, in the storefront. We're at over 85% sustainable. Wow. Effort, like, like, know our supply chain on 85% of our things. We're getting there. But it has taken, I mean, it's taken a year to do to do all that. I mean, I think for a year, that is miraculous. Because there are so many other boutiques out there, retailers, et cetera, who are like, Mm -hmm. it's just too hard, so I won't do it, right? I mean, I think a lot of us get in our heads like that. Well, how could I ever have the impact of, say, Amazon? You know, so why bother trying to have an impact at all? I understand that. I really do. And I think the biggest thing that stuck out to me has been, uh, we've been in a pandemic for however many years at this point, Mm -hmm. right? I know it's forever. And, well, I mean, this doesn't even, it's just a, a long time, yeah. right? <laughs> and I feel like one of the things that the pandemic really brought to light among so many things, but it was the actions of one impact us all. And each individual human has the power to make a change in their own you know, their own little corner of the world, and then it expands. But my actions absolutely do impact other people. And we really saw this so clearly with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like it was a I mean, it, it's been fascinating, really. So that's the kind of mindset I, I took into switching the boutique, because yeah, we are a small business. I'm not, I'm not a corporation. I mean, at one point, I think we had seven full time employees, but now we're down to one, excuse me, two, two full time employees. Um, and it will be. It's so easy to say, what I do doesn't really matter, but it really does. And we've seen that so clearly over the course of this pandemic that my actions or individual actions really do impact one another. Absolutely. I mean, like, yeah. listen, the past few years have been really horrible. Yeah. But I think so many of us have learned so much and, and how much yeah. we do matter and our decisions mm-hmm. do matter. I mean, just even thinking about you and your warehouse with a corner dedicated to trash. Oh my gosh. I was dedicated to trash. Like it's cringe it's cringe. It's cringe worthy right now. Like we li- we had it like and it was more than a corner, okay? Like it was it expanded into the warehouse. Like it was bad. It was bad. Yeah. I mean like and that's like if you could think of all, you know, I I talk on the show all the time about how small business is so powerful. It, and yeah. it has such a major impact on the planet if we support it because mm-hmm. individuals can make changes like this. What, Like, once again, you're like, oh, it took us a year. And I'm like, wow, that was so fast. You know, like, yeah. like that's the difference yeah. between a small business and a big retailer. Like, if, if tomorrow mm-hmm. H&M was like, no, we're really going to do things the right way. I mean, it would take them like 10 years to dismantle yeah. whatever they've built and the impacts – Right. would also be negative, not just positive. I mean, it would be, it's not something they're going to do, right? Because they just, they just mm-hmm. can't. Um, and I think yeah. it's just like one more reason to shop small because you see this impact playing out in front of you. And it's it's incredible. So you were, you were telling me, you know, before all of this, you would go to Magic, you would source stuff mm-hmm. online. And, you mm-hmm. know, for everybody who's listening, Magic is this huge... I mean, I'm going to say it. It's a fast fashion trade show. Whew. Yes, it is. Uh, that is a good way to put I was that. just there yeah. t- a few weeks ago. Um, mm-hmm. And it was it was really small this time. Uh, mm-hmm. And so what was left were kind of the worst, most fast fashion-y clothes. Like all the biggest yeah. fast fashion brand. Like you, you yeah. as a, uh, the average customer doesn't know these brands, right? They're not like mm-hmm. household names, but you see them in all kinds of boutiques all over the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. it, from what I can gather, a lot of them have disappeared during the pandemic. And so we're left with the sort of biggest fast fashion yeah. providers, if you're, wi- if you will. Yeah, it, it's not good. The trajectory is just 
is not good. I have a stepdaughter who's almost 11, and we were talking about sustainability. And I love it. <laughs> I know, I know. And she said to me, because I was talking about um, polyester, I was like, oh, you know, honey, polyester does not, like it stays in a landfill for a very long time. And she said to me, she goes, well, what's going to happen we, when we run out of room? Shh. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know, honey. I, I, I don't know. I don't know either. I have anxiety about that. I know. And like, I don't understand how people don't understand. We have a finite amount of resources. I know. Like this, this is not really even an option to change anymore. Like there has got to be a better way. And I really do believe small businesses and small brands that are, you know, and consumers, like educating consumers, because I was in the industry and I had no idea, no idea. And so I really... I do have hope for the fashion industry as a whole, but we have a long ways to go. Long ways. Long to ways. Go. Long ways. I mean, the polyester is a really good point to bring up because yeah. most people think of polyester as being like a '70s thing, right? But actually, mm-hmm. we're living in the golden yeah. era of polyester with like 60 right. to 70 percent of new clothing being polyester. It's just like sneakier now. Like it's not yes. the thick. I mean, you know, yep. you see a 70s polyester, yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. yeah, that's poly. You can see it from like across the room, right? right? But now right. but now it's yeah. like silky or sheer or drapey mm-hmm. and all of these things. And, you know, I remember before we were talking so frequently about climate change, you know, 20 years yeah. ago, it was like, we're going to run out of fossil fuels, right? Like that was the conversation mm-hmm. all the time. That was sort of what started the the development of electric cars and, you know, alternative energy sources. Um, Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, this is before we started making nine gazillion polyester clothes, which are made out of Hmm. fossil fuels. And I feel like we don't, Mm -hmm. we don't talk about that enough that, you know, if you, we, I mean, we have to change our habits around driving and flying and everything anyway, but Mm -hmm. regardless, we're, we're pouring tons of of oil into clothing and other like semi disposable things that could have mm-hmm. at least in the future been used for transportation. You know, it's gross. Right. It's really gross. I was just in Vegas again last week for another trade show, and mm-hmm. what appalls me most when I'm there, I mean, it's a lot of things, is mm-hmm. all of the plastic that I see yeah. everywhere I go. Like people walking down the yep. strip with these huge disposable plastic cups full of like Mm -hmm. so-called daiquiris you know and like those are going to go in the trash right like there's just so much everything is plastic there i went to a restaurant where all the utensils were plastic the packaging was plastic and it's just like that's just one place but you know i think we look at a plastic cup and we're like oh that's so wasteful but we don't look at the polyester clothes Mm -hmm. and think about those yeah Yeah, completely agree completely agree there has to I know it, it sounds very doom and gloom a lot of the time, it right? Does. And I, I totally get that. And I really do believe that more people are starting to realize these things. I mean, I'm a, I'm a great example. I had no idea, no idea what I was doing, contributing to the landfills and the, this overconsumption mindset, right? Of just, you need to buy this in order to fill some void. And I didn't know. And I I just have to believe that there are a lot more people out there that are going to realize, especially, you know, when we get through this pandemic, like that I what I do does matter. It does have an impact. And I know it can feel overwhelming. And I know it can feel stressful. But it's like, I have to go back to that that hope that like I really do have for humanity, which I feel silly saying that, but. No, I mean, I think you're a great example. Like you're not an environmentalist. You know what I mean? You're not like a scientist, you know, you're not not like an activist who's out there like chaining yourself to trees, right? Right. You're a person who you're a small business owner. You love clothes. You love Mm -hmm. what you do. And you have all these other passions around size, inclusivity, and so many other things that we're going to talk about. And yet you were like, hey, I'm realizing this and I'm going to make a big change. And I think that's what's really important is I think sometimes we we think, well, 
we can't be a person who makes impact. We can't, Mm -hmm. nothing we do matters, right? We like don't have the reach or the influence or any of that. And that's just not true. I mean, think about the clothing alone that you were buying and selling that came wrapped in the plastic with the plastic hangers. Even just Mm -hmm. thinking about not having that anymore. I mean, that adds up. It does. Yeah, we did really well in 2020. Like the the pandemic, the first part of that pandemic, yeah, we ended up doubling our revenue from 2019 to 2020, oh, more than doubling wow. our revenue. And I mean, we we walked away. We were like, I can't do this. I, I just, if something like doesn't sit right, it's like, yeah, you just, it just couldn't do it anymore. I mean, I think that's, do it that's so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. It, I, I really appreciate that because it's been it's been hard. And like, of course, small business is always hard. Retail is always hard. During a pandemic, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I have two little kids. Like, it's just yeah, hard. Yeah. But, yeah, hearing like, you know, I've had a couple of clients come up to me or just write uh, DM me over Instagram and just say, like, I didn't know before and now I do and thank you. And it's like, okay. Start there, start there, and just slowly build. Like, I just, I really got to hold on to that hope, you know, of we really will be okay. I mean, I, I love that. So let's talk about it, because it was hard, right? So yeah. what did you do with all the stuff you already had? <laughs> yeah, we sold it pretty much at or below cost. We did. So we had a big um, warehouse, like, just got rid of stuff got rid of a lot of stuff. We donated a lot as well. We have several um, local charities we work with, an LGBTQ uh, youth charity that's close by us. Um, we have a couple houseless um, houseless charities. And so we donated a lot and we sold a lot at or below cost. Oof. And then we sublet our warehouse and uh, we um, just really focused on finding vendors that matched all of our boxes and let me tell you that was the biggest <laughs> I mean <laughs> I'm sure like I, when you wow. when you and I were preparing for this I was just like once again I can't believe you were able to pull this off in a year because it's so hard right and we're going to talk about that but even just getting clear transparent information like you don't oh get gosh. it until you try to do it it feels impossible oh and then the answers that some <laughs> Um, some reps give you, you're like, what on earth does that even They don't mean? know either. They don't know either. No. <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, when we first started this journey of like trying to get transparency from our vendors, I didn't really understand how to read the the emails that they were sending me trying to describe their supply chain. I was like, oh, that sounds good enough, right? Like, that, that maybe that's okay. And then you get farther in it, and you're like, oh, no, they were just talking out of their you-know-what what because they didn't know either. And, uh, yeah, it was it was not easy because, yeah, we lost, we lost a lot of customers, a lot of vendors. I believe we had, oh, my gosh, I need the actual numbers, but we probably had 100 vendors that we were buying from. Mm-hmm buying from and now we're at about 30 and we wow. we've definitely diversified our offerings like we have um, a lot of home goods now like eco home goods mm-hmm. um, just because like it just first of all doesn't exist in the clothing industry like it is it is remarkable how challenging it is to find a transparent supply chain <laughs> like it is almost impossible and then size inclusion has oh. always been a main <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is that is where I just get like super passionate because 70% of people identifying as women in the states are a size 14 or above. The vast majority of quote sustainable slash ethical brands carry up to a size large. Vast Don't majority. get me started. <laughs> Oh my gosh, maybe an XL. Like if they have an XL, they quote carry plus size. I'm like, no, you don't. And no, you don't. the XL is probably like really so- small. Yes. yes, absolutely, absolutely. And so size inclusion has been built into our brand from the get-go. I mentioned at the beginning, we have a nonprofit. We have a foundation um, that it helps fund treatment for people struggling with eating disorders. So being anti-diet culture and accepting 
accepting all bodies and making this safe space for people that have lived or that live in marginalized bodies is incredibly important to me. Like that is what, that is the heart of our business is that nonprofit in eating disorders and marginalized communities. Like that's what we care about. Mm -hmm. And then switching everything like, oh my gosh, I can't find it. I can't find it. And it just does not exist. I'm telling you, I think we found maybe three clothing vendors, three. And one is local to Portland. And I'm like, thank God, because somebody out there else is doing it because it is virtually impossible to find. And I don't want to hear anyone's excuse anymore for it. I'm like, I'm so overhearing excuses about how it costs too much to make above a size large. It doesn't. It really doesn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so tired of hearing it, too. Especially like if you look at some of the larger, like, so-called sustainable brands. I mm-hmm. went on a weird, creepy scavenger hunt, a few, I guess maybe I, more like detective work uh, uh-huh, a few weeks ago it. where I was like, I just want to know, like, what's the size of these businesses? Where's their money coming from? And yeah. basically any larger one that you're seeing on Instagram that's taken out tons of ads, they have yeah. investment money, right? They're not, yeah. I'm not talking about the small makers who are literally at home sewing everything themselves mm-hmm. or with like one other person. We're talking like Mm -hmm. they are placing orders with factories. They have a team Mm -hmm. working for them. And they're taking a decent amount of investment money. Budget for Mm -hmm. it. Budget in your P&L for a fit tech, for for fit models. I'm sorry. It's it's ridiculous. It's not. No, it is not that much more expensive. Because like I mentioned, we started our own clothing line. And it goes up to 5X. It is not that much more expensive. I'm like, I can actually pull the freaking numbers and tell you. It is not. Like, that is just some BS excuse. I I don't. And it's rooted in fat phobia and diet culture and all of that. And I'm just, I am so tired of hearing that excuse that it doesn't sell. Well, you didn't try. You're not making a welcoming environment for people that live in marginalized bodies. Like, by only... In advertising or any kind of media, if they only have one body represented, it's like, no. of Of course not. Of course they... Of course not. So totally. Yeah, I can go off. Oh on my that, gosh! So. I mean, I, I, it's. <laughs> I I feel like every time I like you know someone sends me a screenshot of reaching out to one of these brands to be like, why don't you offer more than a large? Why don't you offer more than extra large? It's like, oh, well, mm-hmm. it's just like we're a small business, and I'm like, you know what? You guys, fuck you, because it does. There matter. are people who sew one matter. garment at a time who are making all sizes and figuring it out. Mm-hmm. You can do it too. You have the resources. You're literally yep. leaving money on the table. That's how deep seated your anti fat bias yeah. is. That is that is that is fat phobia. It is the diet culture equates moral superiority to living in a smaller body. And unfortunately, there is also this sense of moral superiority in many sustainable and ethical fashion mm-hmm, brands. Mm-hmm. So of course, like what why would somebody that lives in a larger body care about all these things, right? If they're not moral, right? And it just doesn't, I can't, I can't. I, you know, when you, the first time you told me that, I was like, wow, you're so right. Because I see if you, if you were like thinking about these brands and their current consumer base, there are all Mm -hmm. of these like, like the Venn diagram of it. There are all these intersections between sustainable fashion and well, so-called wellness culture and like Mm -hmm. goop and diet culture. And it's all like, intersects far more than it doesn't and so of course they're leaving out all these people because it's not about sustainability it's not Mm -hmm. about being ethical because if it were they'd be dressing more people if these brands were on a true mission to change the industry and make it more equitable more ethical truly not so bad for the planet they would say hey we want to dress as many people as possible so more and more people can take part of this and can be the norm. Right. We're going to make all these sizes. They're not. To me, nope. it says that they don't care. They don't care about exactly. a better world. No, they don't. And it's that's not their motive. And so then it makes... I mean, there's many questions to be asking, but that is like, well, then why why are you doing this? Because it's trending? Not a good answer. Like, And that's what that says to me. That's what it says. Mm-hmm. It says a sustainable brand is not, they don't actually care. And I just, I don't want to be a part yeah, of that. Yeah, it seems so fake to me. That's how I feel too. I get riled up all the time with these brands. 
So, yeah. Okay, so you make all these changes. It's really, really hard, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. How did it go? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, still going currently. Right. Um, it was. It was the hardest thing we ever had to do in our business. I'm sure. Tell us about it. I won't. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like we lost, first of all, we lost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we lost a lot of customers because people want that $5 t-shirt. And as many times as I say, a $5 t-shirt does not exist. Mm -hmm. Just because you and I didn't pay for it, somebody paid for Mm -hmm. it. Whether that was not getting paid, whether that was being treated horribly, like somewhere along the supply chain, somebody paid for that t-shirt. But a lot of humans were not ready to hear that. And I, they, they went away and that's okay. That's perfectly okay. And during this time also, we also began being, well, we really dialed in our mission because it was a bit of an identity crisis, if you want to call it that, (laughs) because I knew that we couldn't do that anymore, but I didn't know what we could do. And being like, it was a very hard stop being, not being able to find um, size inclusive pieces, right? Like it was a hard, hard stop. And so we had to sit down. I sat down with my team. I have the best general manager ever. Like she came, she came from a a corporate background, but this woman's heart's in nonprofit world. And she's just like dynamite human being. And she and I had multiple conversations like, okay, this is where we want to go. Mm -hmm. This is where we are. Who are we and what do we stand for? You know, if we're going to make a change in our business, we're going to just make a change. And we're going to sit down and we're going to figure out what exactly we care about and what we stand for. And we're not going to be shy about who we are anymore as human beings and as a company. So we sat down and we came up with three pillars of our, mi- of our mission statement. Sustainability, inclusion, and social justice. All three of those mission pillars were what we based every decision on after that. So once we got incredibly clear on who we were and what we wanted to accomplish with our business, like it's always been, like my business has always been more than a business with me. Like we opened the nonprofit maybe six months or so after after having this, um, the boutique and a portion of all sales at the uh, boutique donated to the nonprofit. Like it's, it's what keeps me going on hard days, mm-hmm. right? But really dialing in who we are and what we stand for and the messages that we want to portray, like, we want to be a safe place for people that live in marginalized bodies. Right. And automatically that turns off a lot of humans. (laughs) And that's okay. I had to really come to terms with that. Like, we got a lot of not very nice emails, a lot of... A lot of it. Um, we, our storefront is in a very conservative downtown in right outside of Portland, <laughs> Oregon, in da- downtown Oregon City. You want to know what we did, Amanda? What did you do? Oh, my gosh. We put rainbows up everywhere. <laughs> rainbows <laughs> everywhere. So our door is, like, covered in rainbows and all the things just and apparently that ticks people off. Like I, have, I didn't know the rainbows. Could not be I mean, mad. you never know. You know, like there's all this idea of like progressives and liberals being these like delicate snowflakes. And I am like, I would beg to differ because we don't get offended by things like rainbows. Uh, a rainbow. <laughs> It's a rainbow, <laughs> and you should have. Oh my gosh! You, I'm like, what? What? I, I, I said. We also have a sign that says, like, we welcome all all people in the, you know, all the things, and like, do not enter if you have symptoms of COVID, transphobia, fatphobia, homophobia, any of those kind of things. And I don't know how that pisses people off. I'm like, just don't come in. Like, it was a very hard. It was a hard stop though for everybody. And all that to say, we once we dialed in who we were and what we stood for, it became a lot easier for us to make decisions. So that was really key for us in making businesses business decisions. Ooh, that's hard to say. Business <laughs> decisions that aligned with our values. And we had to stick by it. Like there were many times when we were like, well, this company does this, but it only goes up to this size, but ooh, do we do it? And it's like, nope, can't do it. So we 
it was it was tough. It was really tough. There's not really a better way to say that other than it was really hard. But getting clear on who we are and what we stand for was critical for us because people have opinions about everything. Right. And when you start to stand up and say, like, this is not okay, this is wrong, and these are the reasons that we believe this, you're going to get a lot of pushback. And going back to this is what we believe as individuals, as a company, and we are going to stand on this mission statement. So it became that filter for us that was made it just cl- much more clear for us. I mean, I love that, you know, like, and I think even as just an individual, if you don't own a business, you're just trying to live, live your life in the most ethical, Mm -hmm. responsible way. Mm -hmm. I think putting those filters on for yourself actually makes life a lot easier. We live in a capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. We we do. And the quickest way I've found to impact change is knowing where I'm spending my mm-hmm, money. Mm-hmm. And if a business says, I support LGBTQ, I support, you know, people in, mar- like, all marginalized bodies, like, yes, I will spend my money with you. And if I hear otherwise, I'm like, well, I'm going to just find somewhere else. So it's really been, it's empowering to know that, like, our dollars, they really do have an impact like when people choose to spend their money with us, it makes a very noticeable difference in our lives, you know, in the lives of my employees, in our foundation, in all all the things. Like it really, I think we can forget that so easily. Like we really can make change. And it, it's, it is a one positive that's in our, the way our society is set up. It is. It, it really is. Yeah. You know, like, once again, it's so easy to feel like you have no power, like nothing mm-hmm. you do matters. And that's just not true. You know, yeah. and I think we all we all feel that way sometimes. I'm sure there are times mm-hmm. where you were like, this is so hard. What if oh no one gosh, ever shops yeah. here again and nothing gets better? <laughs> but it it did. Yeah. Right. I'm sure. Listen, yeah, I'm sh- I'm sure you had lots of customers who missed your fast fashion. Right. Um, and who were angry about it and probably said unpleasant Mm -hmm. things. Uh, Mm -hmm. The people who said bad things about the rainbows, they can, whatever, they can go kick rocks. Who can say bad things about rainbows? I know, right? That's his, like, gosh, snowflakes. Um, I know. But, you know, like, it's it's working, right? And I'm sure, yes, you lost some customers, right? But I bet you've also gained some new customers and met some really amazing new people. Yeah, that's, that is very true. We lost a lot of customers, but the ones that we gained, they care. And they share the same values and the same mission and the same desire to do good. You know, we don't always know how to do good. Mm -hmm. We don't always know how to impact change. We don't always know the next right thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. But the clients that we have now want that. They want that as well. And it's very, it feels like home now to me when I go into our storefront and our, yeah, it's just, it's a comforting feeling knowing that like we've worked so hard to create this space that people can come in. Like if you're a size 4X, cool, come in, like just come in. And something else I love about our store is that we don't have a quote plus size section and the same, it's the same cost for all the sizes. It always really bothered me, like how (laughs) all the stores would have this like little tiny section shoved in the back corner, not well lit. It felt like a corner of shame. Yep. And no, we're not. We don't do that. We we don't. We don't we're not doing. Yeah, that. Yeah, everyone stupid. should get to shop together. I hate that. I hate that so much. Yep. And it's funny that you yep. still see this happening at most All stores, right? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> if a, if a, yeah. even the fast fashion retailers who are like sort of size inclusive, who offer plus sizes, like they're they're in a separate part of the store. They are more expensive, yep. even though they're the same things. And it just. I'm going to yep. tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. Even the more expensive thing, you just make it work. 
you get out a calculator yeah. and you futz around with it until everything can be the I same think- price. <laughs> I know, I know. And then I'm like, that goes back to diet culture now, doesn't right. it? Because we live in this society that is obsessed with con- controlling particularly women's oh, bodies. Yeah. It's everybody's body, of course. But women just tend to get the yeah, women just get a, are a little bit harder on. Um, but yeah, it's it's diet culture and this obsession with controlling women's bodies. And I don't like it. I don't, I like, don't it. like it either. It makes me really, really angry. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer, but Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro business. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Gabriella Antonis will create custom made-to-measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. And that's Gabriella with one L. Gotta get that spelling right. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at salt hats. Karen Kinney Studio. Located in Western Massachusetts, Karen specializes in handcrafted earrings from found, upcycled, and repurposed fabrics, as well as other eco-friendly curios, all with a hint of nostalgia, a dollop of whimsy, a dash of color, and 100% fun. Karen is an artist slash designer who believes the materials we use matter. See more on Instagram at Karen Kinney Studio or online at www.cKinney.com. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. 
Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. One of the things you've done, you mentioned this, is you've started your own line, uh, I guess mostly, but not completely, because it's been really, really hard to find mm-hmm. what you want out there. So mm-hmm. did you like assume when you like when you were a little girl, were you like, I'm going to be a fashion designer when I grow up? Not at all. <laughs> no. I, I, I came from healthcare. Actually, I was a physical therapist prior to having the boutique. So I was a, I worked in um, skilled nursing facilities. So like post-acute care, I helped rehab people after uh, strokes and surgeries and, and all the things. But after I had my first son, which he just turned five, which I can't even wow, believe that. that's such a good age. I yeah, love five. <laughs> I know he's going into kindergarten. I can't even, I can't even. Um, but I remember going clothes shopping. I was about six weeks or so postpartum from him. And I struggled a long time with an eating disorder growing up. About 15 years of my life was spent in, um, in and out of treatment for anorexia and bulimia. So I was I had a long time with an eating disorder. And I remember going clothes shopping six weeks after oh. I had my dear sweet son. First of all, PSA, don't do don't that. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. It's a really bad decision. Yeah. Um, but I went into the fitting room, and of course nothing fits me because I'm six weeks postpartum. Right. And nothing is supposed to fit you. Like, it's fine. It's fine. But I remember that feeling of feeling so bad about myself and feeling like there's something wrong with me. I failed. I didn't do this good enough. Like there's something wrong with my body. I am not good enough. And it was all the messages that are subtly around you when you're clothes shopping. Mm -hmm. It's from the size of the mannequins that are available or shown. It's just all these different messages say if the clothes don't fit you, there's something wrong with your body. And my husband was with me at the time. And I turned to him and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up a store that's going to be different. I'm going to do it. And he was like, okay, honey, that's a really great idea. You know, six <laughs> weeks postpartum, I'm crying, I'm hormonal. And my little my little guy ever was just screaming because, you know, he's that's six what weeks they do. old. Yeah. Yeah. And then nope, not even a year later, we ended up opening the store and – so that that inclusion piece, I mentioned it as being one of our pillars um, in our current mission statement, but that has always been central to our business. And it's evolved a lot. The business has evolved so much over the course of these five years. But that that inclusion piece, that desire to help people in all bodies feel safe and feel it's okay to come in and shop. No matter what size body you live in, you deserve to feel good in your body. Because I spent so many years hating my body. Mm-hmm. And I would argue most people, most women, people identifying as women, don't often love their bodies. You know, we're all, most of us are trying to change them in some way, shape, or form. And I don't like that either. So we just wanted to make a place that was going to be different. And we did. I mean, that's that's incredible. I, I think it's interesting. I've had so many guests on the show who had no vision when they were younger that they were mm-hmm. going to get into this field, that they were going to open a store or start their own line. Yeah. And they always c- end up coming at it in this very personal way. Like that's what the journey mm-hmm. is. Something in their yep personal life, their relationship with clothing, their bodies, it drove them to do it. And we need more of that because for people who come out of, you know, like a fashion education, 
a lot of them mm-hmm. have already had some really bad ideas drilled into their brain, whether they know it or not. Not right. that people sure. who go to fashion school are bad people, but you know, they're they're they come into this world that's like this is how it is, and that's just how it is. And so yeah. there is something special about saying, like, I'm an outsider. I came at it because of my yeah. personal experiences. You haven't already been told that it can only be this way. So mm-hmm. you don't know that, that that's what the world's gonna try to tell you, you know? For sure. Yeah. I yeah, I really I've kind of joked a little bit before about like, oh my gosh, I came from healthcare. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, right? (laughs) But it really, it was really a good thing, actually. Because yeah, like you mentioned, I didn't have all these preconceived ideas of how it was supposed to be until I got into the industry and then realized, oh my gosh, we're a fast fashion boutique. This is not okay. Um, But yeah, it it was not a bad thing. Definitely not a bad thing to have no idea what I was doing. And you learn. You figure you it do. out. Like, that's what yeah. you do. You read books. You listen to amazing podcasts like this one. And that's what you do. So you figure it out. Yeah. And you just make it happen. You know? I mean, you definitely yeah. pulled off what, like, I'm just going to say this again, what so many people would think of as impossible. And you're you're doing it. And you didn't have to close your business and declare bankruptcy Mm-mm. and, you know, no, nope. like, like it's working, even though it's scary and it's it's hard. It it can work. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about your line. Yeah, I love it so much. <laughs> um, it's called Hope Continues, and hope hope has been another one of those central themes in our entire business. And it seems so fitting, like just at the point we are in this world, and it's like no hope continues hope Mm -hmm. continues and so it is a size inclusive we make um, extra small through 5x ethical sustainable all those things oh my gosh it's made of hemp it's made of hemp wow no i love hemp so much um and it's a seven piece like capsule collection and i'm calling it for the sexy minimalist (laughs) because that's the kind of style i love and we actually named each piece and each piece was inspired after a greek goddess so it has this like blending of power and sensuality to it it's a very it's a very pretty line in my humble opinion (laughs) who designed it all so I'm really really excited about it we are the pieces are set to arrive in May to us it's a spring summer collection and yep seven pieces but it's actually up for pre-order pre-order right now because it's expensive to do things ethically it because it is it shouldn't be but it is right it is. It's the reality of the our society, and that uh, it's okay. Like it's, it's okay. We we understood that at the beginning, and it was worth it to me. I was like, okay, well, did everyone get paid? Okay, check, and it's worth it. I mean, I think so too. You know, one of the yeah. the only thing that is less expensive now than it was in the nineteen nineties is clothing, and everything is a lot oh more gosh, expensive. Really? Yeah. So we oh, just no. don't even understand how much clothing should be and unfortunately you know we've got it we've got to change that mindset yeah. that we shouldn't we be able to go into a store and spend a hundred dollars and leave with a whole bag of clothes we don't need a whole bag of clothes for a hundred dollars right. unless they're second hand yeah. fine but like we yes. we need to change our thinking about that you know yeah. people in the 80s 90s before that they didn't go shopping with the expectation of coming home with four outfits for a very small amount of money. Like we just have to, we have to d- yeah. delete that from our brains that that's even a possibility, right? Yeah. And I also, I mean, my yeah. personal feeling is like your relationship with what you buy with your wardrobe, whether you realize it or not, is colored by mm-hmm. the origins of those clothes. Like if they were cheap, mm-hmm. if you know that exploitation was involved, if you know that they're like not built to last or they don't, and you can tell they don't fit you very well or make you feel that confident, yeah. you're not going to wear them. You're not going to feel special wearing them. And so mm-hmm. I'd rather have less that costs me more that I know has all this like good origin story behind it because yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to wear that stuff all the time and feel, feel my best. That's an entire mindset shift for our entire culture because we have this idea that, We always need more. And it it goes along with diet culture Mm -hmm. and this idea that we're not enough as we are and 
We always need to be looking for that next thing to make us happy. In speaking in the diet culture world, it's this next diet, this next exercise program, this next whatever, whatever it is that's going to, quote, finally fix you. It's that same mentality with fast fashion. It's you are not enough as you are. So here, here's all these things that are going to make you feel good about yourself. And it's feeding a monster. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really like this giant monster that is fast fashion and the diet culture. And it all is related. It's it's fascinating the more I'm like digging into the the intersection of diet culture and sustainability and all of those things. It's it's quite fascinating, really. And they're so, so connected. Absolutely. I do. Th- I mean, I just anecdotally find that when I'm feeling the most unhappy with my life, whether I like hate my job Mm -hmm. or I'm in a bad relationship or I'm not in a relationship and want to be in a relationship Mm -hmm. or just there's something about my life where I feel like I don't quite have control over it. There are two Mm -hmm. things that I always do. One is I Mm -hmm. spend a lot of time hating my body and figuring out how to change Mm -hmm. it. And two, I buy a lot of stuff that I don't even like. It's all connected. (laughs) Yep. And it's, it, you know, too, it's like, you, you know, these things and it's still, it's so ingrained in us. And like I mentioned earlier, I struggled with an eating disorder for a very long time. And still to this day, when I get stressed out, my go-to is I feel fat. Mm-hmm. And I've, lear- I've learned 20 years in therapy that fat is not a feeling, right? But it's like, what did, what's under all that? But that is, it's such an automatic go-to, like, I hate my body. Something is wrong with me. I need to mm-hmm. fix it. I need to control this aspect of my life. And it's interesting. Well, I mean, it goes back to this idea that you pointed out earlier of like, we look at being larger as a failure as a human. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. And the, it, yeah, and it doesn't, our entire society is based on that. Like the the medical, medical field, everybody has these weight biases in these fat phobic things um there's gotta be there's gonna have to be a lot of system overhaul in the next few years i think um yes yeah (laughs) yeah it all starts with us though just being like hey we're Mm -hmm. not gonna put up with it anymore it's stupid and supporting one another yeah as we go through this because for so many of us it is so deeply entangled in like it's like one time my cat got a whole spool of of thread and unwound the whole Uh thing around the house and it was like a it was like booby trapped like there was just thread everywhere and you could never (laughs) get it all it was like it would turn up months later here's some more wrapped around a corner around something that's how i feel like diet culture and fat phobia and all of these things are in our brains and i think the best thing that we can do is help one another untangle yes. it and yes. and like be the person who spots the hidden threads in your friend's minds you know be mm-hmm. like hey mm-hmm. i see what's happening here let's talk about it because i do think yeah. it's like this vicious cycle of feeling bad and then buying stuff yeah. and feeling even still feeling bad possibly feeling worse then going back and feeling bad again and it just leads to so much unhappiness and i like i'll be the first to say i've spent so much of my life hating my body and every once in a mm-hmm. while, I think, why? Like, this is all I have. Yeah. This is it. This is me. My body is me. Yeah. Do I hate me? Women. You know? Yep. Yep. And women in particular have been quite subject to this over the course of uh, however long, right? Like, I can remember my grandma talking about, you know, going on diets and hating her body and stuff. And my, my grandma's passed away. Like, this is a generational mm-hmm. thing. Like, a lot of people have been through this. Yeah. When I'm thrifting, I see so many really, really bad, bad idea, like diet cookbooks from like the 50s and 60s and 70s where everybody was like, yeah, have your cottage cheese and a piece of jello and like some cabbage. And it's just like, gosh, this has been going on. Like, I remember hearing this stuff coming from my grandmother's mouth, my mom's mouth. Like, it's like we we're never going to end this if we don't all take a stand and support one another and you know, work on ourselves to break the habit. That's, it's like, it is generational at this point. Yeah. And women, I'm just going to speak for women right now, because that's what I identify as. And that's where I am. But um, women have been kept small. And we've been kept quiet. 
and we've been kept contained. And that is the ultimate goal, I feel like, of this diet culture. Like if I am so focused on my body and the size of my thighs, like what else am mm-hmm. I what am I not focused on? Exactly. You know, I'm I'm not focused on changing changing the world. Like I know that sounds big and aspirational, but that's how I feel. Like if I'm so distracted by focusing on what I ate and the size of my stomach or the my thighs or the fact that this what whatever is going through my head at this point, like that's taking up a considerable amount of brain space. And like I just wonder like what would happen if more women realized their power and their potential in this like I am obsessed with the feminine energy. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. Like this this powerful but sensual, like gentle, like dance, right? Like with femininity and I just feel like it can change the world. <laughs> But we can't get there. We can't get there because we're focused on what our thighs look like. Or like how old we look or are we desirable, yes. whatever that even means, right? right? I mean, it. yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is, it's a, it's a distraction. Yeah, it's absolutely a distraction. That is the perfect way to put that. It absolutely is. And it's like, what would happen if, what would happen if all that brain space was cleared up? I don't know, but I... <laughs> Like, I, I want to know. I think it's a good thing. I, really I think it's a know. good thing, man. I would love to just have that like snipped out of my brain so that I can focus yeah. on other things. Because like no matter totally. how passionate you are about other things or how much time you spend, you know, working on stuff that's important to you, learning new things, all of that, it's still there. It's still there yes. like it, when you wake up in is. the morning every day. And I... I do hate it. I, I, someone Mm -hmm. said to me like a year or two ago, like, don't you think all of this is an intentional distraction? And I was like, wow, I hadn't thought of it Mm -hmm. like that until Mm -hmm. now. And now I can't stop seeing it that way. And you know what? Actually, when Mm -hmm. you start to see it that way, it's sort of like step one to starting to deal with it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the first step because you're acknowledging, you're acknowledging it and you see see it like even in the way we changed our whole business mm-hmm. right like the first step for me was oh my gosh what am i doing <laughs> you know like i had i didn't see the problem prior and i couldn't i couldn't how can you change things if you don't see the problem and i think it's exciting it's I exciting lo- it's really i exciting. love it i love it i'm so excited for yeah. you and once again like you did what so many companies are afraid to do it's possible it is possible totally- it is it it's is. scary. I mean, I'm I'm proud of yeah. you. This is a risk. I know your husband you. was like, "Oh my god, oh my god." <laughs> so he's like the I'm the I'm much more of the dreamer and the idea person, and he's the analytical type, which I know you need to in a business. You need it, yeah. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, yeah. He uh, he thought he was gonna have a heart attack. Like he's like, "You're you're nuts." I was like, "Well, you've said this before, and it's worked out well." So. Here we here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think it's great. I'm I'm so happy for you. So the last thing I just wanted to talk about because we've been talking about eating disorders and mm-hmm. diet culture and really how this yeah. this is what led to you starting your own business, which is yep. you know not what you expect to hear. You know, most of the entrepreneurial stories that exist on the landscape were like, I'm a genius visionary and I went and did it and. Or, you know, oh, I no. am an inventor or I'm just like, I'm a money guy or what you're right. Mm-hmm. Like we, we never hear, I, I just don't think we very often, I'll say this, hear a story of an entrepreneur who was really motivated by something personal and their own commitment to making a better world, like in a real way, not in a fake, like Google kind of way. Yeah. Tell me a little right. bit about all the other work you've been doing to battle eating disorders. Thank you. Um, So we started the business in early 2018. And very shortly after that, I I mean, I've always loved the business. I I always have. It's always had a piece of my heart, right? But then, like, I realized about six months or so after that, I was like, I want to do something more. Like, I need to figure out how to make more of an impact in the space that I'm in. And so I had this fun idea. I was like, I want to do a really awesome fashion show, right? This is my this is my brand at this point. Like July, maybe 2018. I was like, let's do a really cool fashion <laughs> show. We are going to have a silent auction. And the silent auction is going to benefit 
a charity. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my this, this is how it's going in my head. And I was like, okay, what kind of charity? I was like, what am I passionate about? Oh, I'm very passionate about eating disorder advocacy and treatment and all of all of those things. Treatment saved my life on many many occasions. I was in I was in and out of treatment my entire um, teenage years, like hospitalizations and all those things, and it saved my life. But it is so expensive, so expensive. So we are talking without insurance. The average cost of a residential stay is thirty thousand dollars a month. Wow. The average person needs two to three months treatment. It is completely inaccessible. And even if people have insurance, they often have very high deductibles. And even then, you're still running into, if it's a child, parents have to work. They can't most of the time just have their child in this treatment center mm -hmm. without going to see them. And there's just a lot more pieces to mm -hmm. it and a lot more expense pieces to it than people really realize. And I did not... I did not grow up with money, um, but I was very privileged in the fact that my parents, they took out a second mortgage on their house to pay for my treatment. My mom didn't work, so she could take me to all my appointments and all of these things. So automatically, I know that I came from a very privileged place, and that was still so hard financially on my family. And uh, so like I mentioned, they had to take out the second mortgage on their house to pay for my treatment. And back then, this was probably 15 years ago at this point, I had this thought. I was like, someday I'm going to pay my parents back. Someday. Like when treatment finally became my choice, when recovering from my eating disorder was really the only option I had, I, if I live or die, right? That's kind of what yeah. it came down to. Yeah. Anorexia. yeah. Highest mortality rate of all mental illness up to 20% die. About half of those deaths are from suicide. It is not good. <sighs> yeah. it, is, it is a very, it's the deadliest mental illness. Um, but anyways, long story short, I wanted to pay my parents back and I had no idea what that was going to look like tabled that thought, you know, got married, had kids, did all the things. Um, but then I want to have this fashion show and I want to find a charity to work with. And so I kept looking for charities. I was like, okay, there's got to be an eating disorder charity that like funds people's treatment because that's what my parents needed. That's what I needed. I needed actual funds, mm -hmm. right? Education so important, but I need money, right? Like my parents needed money to pay for right. it. And I could not find it. Couldn't find uh. it. Couldn't find it. There's a couple. There's a couple of eating disorder charities that do really, really good work. Really good work. Project Teal is one of them. And I reached out to them. Um, they got back to me, but not like till a month later. And so I had already um, already made the decision at that point to open my own <laughs> nonprofit. Which again, this is another conversation with my husband. I was like, <laughs> what? What? What are we doing now, Julie? And I'm like, well, we are going to open up our own nonprofit. We are going to fund people's treatment for eating disorders. And this is what we're doing. He's like, okay, great. Um, but we did. We did that. And so August 2018, September 2018 or so, we um, applied for our 501c3. And it took probably about a year-ish or so to actually get the, that IRS st um, tax exempt status for that. Um, but that... That nonprofit has always been like what I go back to on really hard business uh, days. Like I really believe you have to have a greater mission because this world will eat you mm -hmm. alive. Like business world, it's 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 tough. And there's so many days when you're like, I can't do this. I can't do this. But when you have that that heart. I don't want to say heart-centered, but you know what I mean. Like when you have that thing that you go back to. So on hard business days, I know that we are making an impact on people's lives. And I've been really hard on myself about 2020, the pandemic and the warehouse and the all the fast fashion. But you want to know what makes it kind of okay in my head? We were able to donate. We did three scholarships that year during the pandemic, the, the beginning wow. of the pandemic, to people that needed treatment. And so I fall back on that. I was like, okay, you know, we we were doing these things wrong, and I didn't know. And now I know I'm going to do better. 
but we we funded three people's treatment to eating disorders, four eating disorders um, during 2020, and that that really really helps. And so that was 2020. 2021, we kind of switched gears a little bit to develop our education and outreach programs because you can fund treatment all day long, but until we're really hitting that prevention side, mm -hmm. until we're working with our youth to help them develop these coping mechanisms and this positive image, body image, and just to know that like, you know what, you're more than your body. Like we have to hit that side of it because we were getting two, three applications a week for people that needed $60,000. And we're like, we can't do this. Like that is, that is just, it's not where we're at. And so over the last year, during all the changes with the business, we, we hired a um, director of education for the nonprofit. And so she really helped us get going on our youth. So we have youth-based body positive art groups is what I call them. So we have once a month, we do an in-person um, like art-based group and we have like take-home kits for kids that don't want to come in um, as well. So just working to empower our youth to love and accept themselves as they are and also we have support groups for adults because we well, let's be real we have a lot of crap to work through ourselves <laughs> yeah true so it, it's all kind of connected and this year I'm really excited to be able to do scholarships and our education program so I'm I'm we're, we're doing well we're doing really well there and it's it really does keep me keep me going on those hard days because it's like you're actually impacting lives and treatment saved my life if it weren't for my parents, like, being willing to take out that second mortgage on their house, like, I don't think I'd be here anymore. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, it's something that's really, really needed. And, yeah, that's a little bit about well, that. Well, I, I mean, I love that. I, th <laughs> I think that's incredible. And, yeah, I mean, you cannot underscore enough how limited access to that treatment mm -hmm. is for so many people. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, I, I think there's always been this misconception that eating disorders are only for a certain type of person. Like, you have to oh my be, gosh. you know, yep. wealthier, like, definitely a lot more privileged yep. financially, uh, socially. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That's just not true. You know? It's not it can true. happen to anyone. It's not true. Anybody, any age, any gender, any race, any, any, anything. And the, there's a lot of problems with this because eating disorders are not recognized in people that live in marginalized bodies, mm -mm. yeah, right? like they are, they're not asked the same questions at the doctor's office. Like, I will admit, I live in a privileged body. I am a tall, thin, white woman, right? Like, I fit the stereotype of what an eating disorder looks mm -hmm. like. And I was a, I was young. I was a um, preteen, teen when it all started, and like, I fit that description. Would I have been, would it have been unrecognized if I lived in a black body? Would it have been unrecognized if I lived in a larger body? You know, there's just so many questions to ask. And it's, it is, one thing I want people to hear on that one is eating disorders do not discriminate. They can and they do occur in people in all bodies. And you cannot tell someone has an eating disorder by looking at them. Yeah. Like just because someone lives in a larger body does not mean they are not struggling immensely with an eating disorder and vice versa too. If someone lives in a smaller body, it really, it, it does not mean they have an eating disorder. It's really, it's not about that. It's really not. Right. Yeah. No, that's definitely something that we all need to work to dismantle because I, I feel that yeah. so many people don't get treatment and suffer for so long. So, so long. long. Yeah. And yeah, it, they're deadly diseases. Like I'm anorexia, highest mortality rate. And like, it's not life. I lived with that for 15 years. And I honestly do not remember a lot of that time of my life. And I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it now because I really do believe it's made me have so much more compassion and empathy and drive now. But that was hard. And if I didn't have the supportive parents and if I didn't have this, this privilege that I by no means had other than just I had it, like, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah. I don't, I don't know either. Yeah. yeah. Well, what, a, what an impressive guest. <laughs> um, do you have any final words of wisdom or just something you want everyone to hear? I mean, I, I feel like this conversation is going to be 
so inspiring for so many people. Thank you. Um, Yeah, what I really want you all to hear is that the actions of one really do impact us all. And your individual actions, my individual actions really do add up and they do make a difference. It is so easy for us to think, what I do doesn't matter. It's not really going to impact change. And it really, really does. It really it does. Really and I think once we take that power and realize, like, this is cool. Like, I really can make a difference. And, you know, it starts in your little corner of the world. It starts with just little tiny corner of the world. And then it just kind of keeps expanding out. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I love that. I think everybody needs to be reminded of that every day. Some days I have to wake up and remind myself of that. Mm-hmm. We all we all need yeah. that sometimes. Totally. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with telling no. yourself that too. Every Write day. it on your mirror <laughs> so you see it. <laughs> That's right. I love doing that. I love writing stuff <laughs> on my mirror. We actually have a, what's called an affirmation mirror at our shop at the um, storefront in Oregon City. And so you know how you, you come out of the fitting room and you see these stupid mirrors, mm-hmm. right? That's what you do. We have things written all over the mirrors. Like you are more than your body. Your worth is not tied to your body. <laughs> like all these things that we 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 want that to be what yes, people say to themselves yes. when they come out of that Absolutely. fitting room. Gosh, <laughs> I have so much dread for that moment when you come out and look in the mirror. So I think that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. So you write all the nice things all over <laughs> it. and then <laughs> Well, th- thank you so much, Julie. This was such a delight. Thank you. I really appreciate it. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles by embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. For the month of March, St. Evans is supporting Heart of Dinner, a volunteer powered organization on a mission to combat food insecurity and isolation within New York City's elderly Asian American community. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns, handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed, made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. 
Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. The Pewter Thimble is a curated secondhand shop based out of Rome, Italy. Owner Desiree Marie Townley has a background in costuming and makeup for dance and opera and focuses on dressing for the character you want to be in the world. Curated collections are dropped in a story sale and always have a specialized theme like the color palette of Starry Night, the film classic Casablanca, and the children's novel The Secret Garden. Desiree works with local artisans, and pieces are rescued from markets and rehabilitated and resold with worldwide shipping. The Pewter Thimble is a collection of pieces that will have eternal style from the Eternal City. Discover more on Instagram at The Pewter Thimble. Thanks so much to Julie for spending some time with me. I meet so many magical, incredible people by working on Clothes Horse. And Julie is just another incredible person working to make this world a better place. You can find her on Instagram as at maryrose.boutique and at hope.continues and on the internet at maryroseboutique.com. She's got a lot going on. You need to go check it all out. Please go give her a follow. I know that I'm so proud of the work she's been doing. Let's support her on her mission. I'm going to end this all. I'm going to end this episode here because, wow, I've been talking a lot today and I'm almost embarrassed about it. (laughs) But remember, the actions of one impact us all. I'm so proud of all the changes you're making in your life. The conversations you've been having with others, all the new stuff you've learned. You are making an impact and keep up the good work. Know that you've got a whole community out there supporting you and watching you grow. Is this cheesy? I don't care. We all need to hear these things a lot more than we are. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse, mostly recorded about six inches away from Janet. Like all episodes around here, this was written, recorded, edited, and hosted by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts and recommend us to a friend. Why did I say us? I meant me. I don't know. (laughs) I'm just laughing at myself now. Thanks, as always, to Justin Travis White for our music and audio support. Bye. Bye.